I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. It may seem strange that we are going to talk about a book whose title is so vulgar, we can't say it on the air. You'll have to use your imagination. I am going to call the book, I guess, Rat Eft. The book is about nothing less than an existential threat to our democracy. And it's especially important now when we're in the midst of one of the most significant presidential elections since World War II. The author is David Daly, the editor-in-chief of the online magazine Salon. David, thank you for coming in. Real I appreciate it. Real pleasure to it. be here. Thank you for having me. So um, what does the title of this book that we can't say, <laughs> what does it refer to? And then I will be asking you why you selected this title, but what does it refer to? Well, I think it refers, as you say, to an existential threat to our democracy. We have been taught in school that gerrymandering is the thing that makes our eyes glaze over, <laughs> that you know, redistricting doesn't really matter. Right. And what I'm trying to say with a title like this is that it's much more serious and important that gerrymandering and redistricting is the fundamental reason why our politics have become so broken, extreme, dysfunctional, and hopeless in the last five years. It, you can trace all of this back to the redistricting that the Republicans did after executing an audacious and entirely new electoral strategy in 2010. So we're going to get to the intricacies of this, but first, somebody must have pushed back against this title. I mean, your publisher or your <laughs> agent or the PR folks or whatever. Uh, did you have a problem? You know, we didn't. Uh, the, 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 the publishers were completely on board with it. I mean, I think if we were to call this gerrymandered nation or <laughs> that thing that puts you to sleep in eighth grade, no, that's true. Um, we might not even be here talking about it. Um, people fundamentally understand that something is wrong, something's not working in our politics, and sometimes you have to throw a little bit of cold water at their face or use a vulgar title to get their attention. <laughs> well, you're, you've gotten the attention of a lot of people. So gerrymandering, and I, and I agree with you, usually people go, oh my goodness, you know, uh, let's move on to the next topic. But it's so important, but I think that there's, a, there's a fair number of people who don't really know what gerrymandering is, so explain that. Sure. We'll drop a little schoolhouse rock on everybody. <laughs> um, the Constitution mandates that all state legislative and congressional lines all the district lines be redrawn every 10 years following the census. Right. The census is conducted every year, uh, excuse me, every decade in a year ending in zero. So that means that the redistricting tends to follow in the winter and spring and summer of years that end in one. That means, as Republican strategists realized in 2009, that the 2010 election meant more than any other election in many ways, that if they were able to have a big win in a midterm election with a Democrat in the White House, and historically the opposition party does right. win big in those years. This is coming in, in 2010, that's two years after Obama exactly, won his first term. That they could have an election in 2010 that actually reverberated longer than the election in 2008. And this is because state legislatures, the people, yes. the, the party that controls the state legislatures in the various states, are the ones who get to, in most cases, who get to do the redistricting. In something like 41 of the 50 yeah. states, it's some combination of the state legislature and the governor who do a redistricting. So if the Republicans have control in a given state, they get to draw the electoral maps. Exactly. And of course, they draw it in a way that favors them. Exactly. Now, they've pushed this to the extreme, which is why you know, we have your, your book. They came up uh, with uh, this major nationwide strategy called Red Map. Uh, explain what Red Map was. It's a brilliant idea, and it's designed by the Republican State Leadership Committee under the leadership of a, a, a really savvy strategist named Chris Jankowski and its executive director, Ed Gillespie, who's the former chairman of the Republican National Committee. And what they realize is that there are 18 legislative chambers that are key to redistricting that only four votes separate control on each side. Right. 
they targeted those 106 seats, essentially nationwide, knowing that if they could tip control of those chambers, state by state, and this is largely in, in blue and purple states like right. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Michigan, Florida. So they're either Democratic states, yes. but with slim Democratic majorities, or they're states that go back and forth. Sometimes exactly. it's Republicans, sometimes Democrats control the legislatures. And they spent $30 million on local state house races. They came in with $30 million, most of it in the last six weeks of these campaigns, in small legislative districts, West Lafayette, Indiana, <laughs> Round Rock, Texas, McMurray Township, uh, Pennsylvania, amounts of money that these little districts have never seen before, right. that these uh, state legislators couldn't imagine being up against. They swamped them in what was already a good Republican year. They gained some 700 plus state legislative seats and they took control of two thirds of all state legislative chambers. Most importantly, they had specifically targeted states in which they could have every seat at the table in redistricting so that the Democrats would have no say at all in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in all of these big states. And Democratic voters played into their hands because Demo Democratic voters are notorious for turning out in presidential election years but not two years later in the off-year elections uh, when you have, well, you know, you have uh, Congress is up for grabs, mm -hmm. um, House of Representatives, I mean, it's every two years you're voting for, for House members, uh, state legislatures, governorships, uh, all of that sort of thing. And the Democratic vote falls off a cliff in these off-year elections. The Democratic vote falls off a cliff, absolutely. Democrats only come out, they only get excited at the presidential level. But what I think is just as important here is the leaders of the Democratic Party didn't understand what was happening and didn't mount a defense against it. Carl <laughs> uh, Rove announces this plan in bright neon capital letters in the Wall Street Journal in March of 2010. He says the party who controls redistricting controls Congress. Right. And he lays out the specific districts that the Republicans are going to go into with the express design of flipping legislative chambers and drawing a big Republican majority in the House in 2011. It's a, it, it's a catastrophic strategic failure by the Democratic Party not to either A, have the imagination to pull this plan off themselves, or B, even figure out how to play defense against it. Right. I think there was also a failure uh, by the press in the sense yes. that this did not get very much coverage and it was an extremely important story, obviously. The American media believes that gerrymandering is boring and it believes that gerrymandering is not the problem in our politics. They believe that both sides do it. It's a classic example of right. the false equivalence that uh, plagues our media coverage. And as a result, they fundamentally missed how redistricting and gerrymandering changed in 2010, how it was a different gerrymander than any other in our history. So the Republicans pull off this incredibly successful, I think nefarious, but also incredibly <laughs> successful uh, coup. Yes. Uh, but they did it. They also uh, had to make sort of a devil's bargain with black elected mm -hmm. leaders and, and, and politicians, most of whom were uh, Democrats, um, to really make this thing work as well as it did. Can you explain that a little sure. bit? Sure. I mean, I think that, that there's two parts of what they did. There's the red map piece that comes in 2010, and there's an earlier piece in the 1990s when Republicans realize that if they don't do something about redistricting, that they're going to be a minority party nationally especially in Congress, for right. a long time. Right. So Lee Atwater elects a 41 Bush, and he becomes chairman of the Republican National Committee. He brings in Ben Ginsburg, his new lawyer, who we all would later meet in Bush versus Gore, and, and who we now see is on a TV very successful commentator. Right. Right. Um, and he brings in 
And he brings in Ginsburg, and on day one he tells him, you are going to have to do something about redistricting. <laughs> the something that he comes up with becomes known as the unholy alliance. Ginsburg figures out that African Americans in the South might be as underrepresented as Republicans in the South. And right. he figures if he can strike a deal with them and use the Voting Rights Act in such a way as to create majority minority seats that this would help at both sides. It would increase the number of African Americans in Congress, but it would also pack all of the Democrats into a handful of districts and make all of the surrounding districts whiter and more Republican. So they, this works perfectly. So they increase the vote in these small, just a few mm -hmm. Democratic districts, and that helps to elect African American representatives. So what okay. you see in North Carolina in 1994 is the delegation goes from 8-4 Democratic to 8-4 Republican, but you also get a Mel Watt and a handful of other African Americans elected to Congress for the first time. So African American representation most certainly increases, but Republicans take over Congress for the first time in 50 and years. And explain why packing these districts with Democrats, which has the effect mm -hmm. of electing a handful of African American representatives, although a handful was more than they had yes, before, absolutely. explain how that helps Republicans. Well, Republicans take all the other seats. When you can pack all of the Democrats into a couple of seats, you effectively give yourself all of the other districts. This is the essence of the gerrymander. This, this is, is racial gerrymandering, actually. Yes, it is. I mean, you're, you're packing yes, is. Uh, not just Democratic voters, but all the black voters in, in these small districts, in, in, in these uh, few happens. districts, right? Absolutely. And the other districts remain overwhelmingly white. They become even more white than they had been before because right. all of the black voters are being moved into these new funny looking districts. Well, you're right that a lot of people, press and uh, individual citizens as well, figure, well, gerrymandering, we've had that since yeah. the beginning of the country. Um, everybody does it. Uh, explain why ordinary voters ought to care about this. Because what happens is that your vote doesn't count. If you want your votes to count, the districts have to be drawn fairly. Let me take you back to 2012, which mm -hmm. is the first election run on these new maps. Democrats, uh, a Democratic House candidates in 2012 win 1.4 million more votes than Republicans. And this is even after yes. a lot of Democratic voters stayed home. Yes, 1.4 right. million. I mean, that's, that's a pretty significant number. Yeah. And the Democrats only shaved seven seats off of the Republican majority in the House, right. which goes to 234-201, and the House stymies President Obama right. for the next four years. Republicans claim a mandate to be a partner in leadership, even though they got 1.4 million fewer votes. Right. If you break that down on a state level, a state like Pennsylvania, Democratic candidates win 100,000 more votes. Republicans take the delegation 13-5. So Democrats win the popular vote in Pennsylvania, yes. but they lose control of the legislature. So the, the congressional delegations in all of these states, Michigan is 9-5 Republican after 2012. It's a Democratic state. 240,000 <laughs> more Democratic votes than Republicans. But because of the way the districts are drawn, it's 9-5. Ohio is nine, the classic. Nine Republicans nine to five Republicans. Democrats. Yes. Republicans control the congressional delegation. Ohio is the classic 50-50 state in America. It keeps us up all night waiting <laughs> for Tim Russert right. to tell us who is going to be president. It's about a 50-50 vote on the aggregate side in congressional races. 12 Republicans, 4 Democrats. 75-25 in a 50-50 state. You add all of that up and what you get is Republican control of a chamber that they did not earn in the popular vote. And when the popular vote does not matter, it means our institutions cease to be effective or even democratic. 
And this is one of the reasons, uh, uh, maybe the major reason, why uh, Democrats have been winning the popular vote. There have been more Democrats than Republicans. Republicans, the GOP is a minority party. Yes. If you look at many of the big issues facing the country, the Democratic position is the position that's favored by a majority of voters, and yet legislation to support these positions uh, cannot get passed. Can it's you talk exactly about that a little bit? It's exactly the reason why. I mean, there's a broad popular agreement on a road forward on immigration, on climate control, on raising the minimum wage, on gun control, on issue after issue, you can find popular majorities of between 50 and 70 percent on a lot of these issues, on, on Obamacare, right. which this House puts through, you know, 50 plus repeal votes. <laughs> um, so what you have in this Congress, because there are so few districts left that are actually competitive, because of the way that the districts are intentionally drawn, the only elections that truly matter are the primary elections. The primary elections are essentially a race to the right, to the base, it becomes a contest of, I'm crazy. No, 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 I'm crazier <laughs> than even you are. And we lose the art of political persuasion. People don't have to talk to anybody on the other side right. anymore. And indeed, the one thing that guarantees you lose if the only election that matters is the primary is if you do try to talk to the other side. And the reason the primary is all that matters is because if it's a safe Republican district, a Republican is going to win He's no matter win what happens, away. then the only contest is between which Republican is going to run. Exactly. So who stands for, I don't know, stronger Republican policies or more conservative or more right wing. Same thing if you've packed the Democratic districts so a Democrat is guaranteed uh, to win. It's, it's going to be a fight among Democrats. So there is no real democracy at work here. No, there's not. And, and certainly no reason for the parties to compromise. None whatsoever, except for the fact that this is where most of the people are. But when you draw the lines in this way, it doesn't matter. We're in the midst of this very important and also very bizarre election, but it's an extremely important presidential election this year. Talk a little bit about how this whole issue, the gerrymandering, the redistricting, the red map campaign, um, the implications for this presidential election. First, I think you can draw a straight line from the redistricting efforts in 2011 to the rise of Donald Trump and the collapse of the Republican establishment. What the Republicans are able to do in 2011 is guarantee themselves a majority in Congress throughout the rest of the decade. However, the kinds of Republicans that they elect are so far to the right that they can't be controlled by the leadership and by the caucus. So what you have, say, in North Carolina, a district in Asheville that was once represented by Heath Shuler, a moderate Democrat, now after Asheville is cracked, it's represented by Mark Meadows, a Tea Party Republican who actually runs his election on a campaign base of, I'm going to send President Obama back to Kenya. He's no bigger a fan of John Boehner. It's Mark Meadows, one of these new crazy Tea Party Republicans from one of these crazy Tea Party districts, who files the petition that leads to the downfall of John Boehner as Speaker. So the Republicans unleash forces within their party that are angry, that are not controllable by leadership, and you can see the rise of Donald Trump in the rise of these districts. Right. What you also have is you're about to have the second election of the last three in which Democrats are going to win more popular votes for the House of Representatives than Republicans. And again, control of the chamber is not going to change. When this happened in 2012, it was the first time since 1972, and you'd have to go back even many decades further to have this happen. It's now about to happen two years out of three. 
So it's essentially Democrats winning the vote, yes. but losing the Congress. This Certainly is the House of Representatives. a serious yeah. Democratic crisis, and people should be seriously outraged. So when I was reading the book in terms of how to remedy yeah. this situation, it was a little scary because you didn't sound that optimistic. It's deeply but, complicated. But what are some of the ways to, to fight back against this? Well, what the Democrats are trying to do is run the same play that the Republicans did in 2010. They have something that they've called Advantage 2020, and they've sunk $75 million into trying to take a Congress back and to be ready for the next a census. In short, kind of try and outdo the Republicans' red map strategy. Except a couple weeks later, the Republicans say, that's great. We've got $135 <laughs> million to do red map, too. So more money than uh, the so, Democrats are you know, yeah. Um So the Democrats have to win on these maps. They have to do it with less money and without the element of surprise that the Republicans had in 2010. It is a tall, tall order. The important thing here to realize is that what the Democrats have to do is go state by state and recapture legislative chambers. If they want to unravel this, there's no national silver bullet. What they have to do is win elections and retake control of chambers state by state and get themselves at least a seat at the table by 2021. It's not going to be easy, and I'm not necessarily convinced it's doable on these maps. Would it work if the Democrats somehow came up with a remarkable turnout effort, turnout campaign, got, since there are more Democratic voters than Republicans, got far more people to the polls, even in the face of voter suppression and all the other problems, would that even be enough to do it, do you think? I think that is perhaps a ticket at the local level that could work. The congressional maps are so weighted that, I mean, 1.4 million votes wasn't enough right. in 2012 to tip more than seven seats. You have to tip 35 seats. Is there another potential remedy, um, nonpartisan uh, uh, commissions or, or committees to draw these maps or whatever, is that? The nonpartisan commission in California has worked really well. Nonpartisan commissions elsewhere have been a challenge, in part because the politicians still tend to run them. Um, we, have to be, we have to find a way to get the politicians out of districting altogether. Right. And we it, are the it, only democracy in the world that allows politicians to draw their own lines <laughs> and, in effect, choose their own voters. Right. And uh, we see what happens when they do. If Trump goes down to a big defeat uh, this year, uh, would that be a suggestion that sort of the Republicans reap the whirlwind from this red map strategy and it, there was, it, it sort of blew back on them? I think that that is a real possibility. The, yes, that they went too far. But they will go too far, and they will still control Congress right. through 2020. So there's not really an incentive for the Republican Party to change. This strategy has been very, very effective as far as taking governorships, as far as taking state legislative chambers, and as far as giving themselves a real hammer lock on Congress. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, my guest has been David Daly. The book is Rat F. That's all we can say on the air, but it's an important book and, and worth a read. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming in. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. I keep hearing that the dismal state of the economy and lack of jobs are among the chief reasons so many working class Americans are supporting Donald Trump's presidential bid. Which is odd, because for the past five and a half decades, the economy has done much better and far more jobs have been created under Democratic presidents than Republican. It's not even a close call. Bill Clinton stressed this point four years ago when he said, factually, that since 1961, 
42 million jobs have been created with the economy under Democratic stewardship, compared to just 24 million under Republicans. That's almost twice as many jobs under Democrats as under Republicans. That pattern has not changed during Barack Obama's presidency. More than 10 million jobs have been created under Obama. Consider this. When Obama took office in January 2009, the economy was losing 600,000 to 700,000 jobs a month. Obama's predecessor, George W. Bush, had the worst job creation record of any of the last six presidents. He was far behind both Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton. Under the eight years of George W. Bush's presidency, just three million jobs were created. Under eight years of his predecessor, Bill Clinton, it was 23 million. So if working class Americans are looking for Republicans to take them back to the so-called good old days of a thriving economy and big time job creation, they need to look again. That's all for now. See you next time.